Well, it's, it's a very interesting topic. You know, uh, metals were not really regarded as uh, part of optics, and that has changed over the past uh, a couple of decades. And now uh, metal optics has become uh, a very big uh, research area. But it has its own paradoxes. And uh, let me uh, uh, indicate uh, on this slide that there are different ways of looking at metal optics. Some people say, oh, it's optics, but it's just an extension of microwaves. And so, for example, uh, the... uh, uh, you have here uh, the uh, uh, microwave circuit, and it's all just uh, distributed capacitors and inductors and so forth. And uh, there are many functions, including especially antennas. All the microwave engineers know that already. Uh, on the other hand, some people say, no, no, it's completely new. It, uh, it has to do with uh, plasmonics, which are special waves that uh, run along the uh, surface of metals. So which is the correct way of looking at things? So they're both, uh, they both have their uh, points of validity, but I am more tilted a little bit toward the circuit approach. So I would like to describe uh, how we can use a circuit approach to understand metal optics. And uh, so uh, the two viewpoints are contrasted here. This is a plasma wave, which is a space charge uh, along the surface. And it uh, runs along the surface in waves. Uh, You see that you have displacement current and magnetic fields and so forth. And you also have a skin depth, et cetera. On the other hand, uh, some people would say, no, it really should be uh, about circuits. And we have the example of uh, the scanning tunneling microscope, a sharp tip, uh, except we can use this uh, at low frequencies, but we can also use it at optical frequencies. And uh, think of this arm as an antenna, a quarter wavelength antenna, and we're focusing the energy to a a very small uh, spot. And uh, the resolution is, this is near field. This is like the previous speaker explained. Uh, uh, Near field, you you can get tremendous resolution, but it's limited by how sharp the tip is. It is not limited by the wavelength. Uh, So this is the circuit viewpoint, uh, which extends all the way to low frequencies to the scanning tunneling microscope. So in uh, trying to convince you that it's helpful to think about this as a circuit problem, uh, I'm going to derive uh, a number of different phenomena as circuits. So I will derive the bulk plasmon. I'll show the circuit for a bulk plasmon, a circuit for a surface plasmon, a parallel plate plasmon, and then indicate that uh, plasmons are useful as transformers to, uh, and uh, interestingly also uh, for uh, the um, hard disk industry they are now uh, using uh, metal optics to uh, uh, focus the uh, energy down. Uh, and then this gets a little bit more sophisticated, the Purcell effect, maybe some of you have heard of the Purcell effect, it's been very influential. Uh, I've been studying it for many uh, years, and I was very surprised it could be derived as a circuit effect. And finally, I will show how antennas can greatly increase the speed of spontaneous emission, even to the point uh, where it might be faster than stimulated emission. So that, that's, that's very exciting. Now, uh, if it's all about circuits, what's different at optical frequencies? And uh, there is something different. And uh, that is that uh, uh, you have the normal inductance of a wire, but in addition to that, uh, you also have uh, uh, some added inductance. Now, this added inductance is coming from the inertia of the electrons, and I think I can show it with my hands. If you apply an electric field on a metal, the current does not begin immediately because first the electrons have to accelerate. And uh, so this is just like an inductor, because an inductor also, you apply voltage, the current does not begin immediately. So this type of inductance is called uh, kinetic inductance. It depends upon the inertia, the mass of the electron. And it's similar to resistance. It scales with length over area. And you might say, well, that's completely new. Not really. Uh, It was well known, for example, to people who study superconductors. When there's no resistance, then the inductance becomes very important. And so that's the source of, uh, that's what's different at optical frequencies. Now, uh, where did it come from? It's really part of Ohm's law. And let me uh, show you. 
this is the conductivity uh, we learn about. If, you, if you've ever taken solid state, this is the conductivity of a metal or a semiconductor. Uh, AC, you just change the denominator. You have 1 plus I omega T in the denominator. And uh, so uh, then uh, we ask, well, what is the impedance? Well, it's 1 over the conductivity times the length over area. And it breaks up neatly into a real part and an co- imaginary part. The real part is the ordinary resistance, and the imaginary part is actually the inductance. It's I omega, and this whole thing is the inductance. So that's where kinetic inductance comes from. And it, uh, it, it makes plasmonics into, uh, into plasmonics. That, that is what's different from uh, uh, ordinary low-frequency electronics. Now, so the first example, I will show that this uh, famous formula from AC electricity uh, will also explain the surface plasmon. Now, of course, to do this, I have to introduce both inductances, the ordinary Faraday inductance plus kinetic inductance, and let's see if that explains the bulk plasmon. Well, uh, I will start with the very simple F equals MA. I, I try to do things uh, simple so I can understand them myself. And then the force is the electric field, the acceleration. And then uh, I want the electric field to be derived from a potential. That's OK. And then what I have to do is I multiply and divide uh, by this thing that has the uh, density in it. And uh, the reason why I'm doing that is I, uh, if I have density times area times uh, velocity, that actually is uh, the current. But it's the time derivative of velocity, so it's the rate of change of current. And now you can see this is voltage related to the rate of change of current. And so this quantity is indeed the kinetic inductance. So I've, I've identified the inductance. The capacitor is a parallel plate capacitor from there to there. And now I have my LC circuit. And I uh, plug it in. And there's a lot of cancellation here. The masses cancel and so forth. And the, uh, the geometry cancels. And I end up with uh, uh, this expression. Uh, which we recognize as being the plasma frequency. So it shows that even the bulk plasmon can be derived as an LC uh, circuit, but you have to take into account the kinetic inductance. Um, Now, if you do this, you say, well, what should we use? Should we use uh, resistance, like in a circuit, or should we use a dielectric constant, like we do in optics? And you could go either way. In in the optical regime, this is uh, the uh, Ampere's law, and it has uh, the uh, uh, relative dielectric constant of the metal. Or we can take the viewpoint that it's really about a circuit, and it depends upon the resistivity. And so both versions of Ampere's law are perfectly acceptable, and both are equivalent if we make this connection between the resistivity of the metal and the dielectric constant of the metal. And you can take either approach. If you know the resistivity of the metal, it's easier to make it into a circuit. And so let me ask if it's possible to come up with a circuit model for uh, just a wave on the surface of metal. And this is a plasma wave, and uh, it's, it's very interesting. Of course, we have a skin depth, and we have some magnetic fields, etc. So let's ask if there's a circuit model for the surface plasma. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a little bit hard to calculate. Uh, one thing we know for certain, actually, the easy part is the kinetic inductance, because the current flows in the skin depth. And this is uh, the expression for the uh, kinetic inductance. But how can we think of this as a transmission line? It's only a flat metal plate. So very surprisingly, a uh, flat metal plate, it is possible to define a a, a self-capacitance on a flat metal plate, and it's a capacitance per unit length. Also surprisingly, on a flat plate, you can also define an inductance per unit length. Uh, But they're a little bit difficult to calculate. But uh, after, I say here, after much electrostatic calculation, uh, the, uh, you actually uh, get it. So here is the uh, uh, kinetic inductance, and uh, the, um, uh, this is the uh, capacitance. Uh, and I, I made this blow up because I have never seen these expressions, very simple expressions for uh, capacitance and inductance of a, of per unit length of a flat metal surface. What's surprising is that we're treating it as a transmission line, but there's no return conductor. 
And uh, the way to think of it is the return conductor is at infinity. So even a single metal surface can be regarded as a transmission line. And these are the capacitance and inductances. So we just plug them into a circuit. And uh, this is the circuit diagram, just three components, uh, distributed, of course. And uh, this is the exact expression for frequency versus wave vector of, uh, of a surface plasmon saturating at the uh, plasma frequency, uh, surface plasmon frequency. And uh, likewise, the circuit model, it's not perfect. It, it does well at the extremes here. It gets the, the, the surface plasmon frequency, gets a speed of light, a little bit of a discrepancy in between, uh, but a surprisingly accurate description of, uh, of a surface plasmon from uh, a three-element circuit. So I regard that as uh, kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, encouraging. And this is the exact solution. OK. And this is the same thing uh, plotted on, uh, uh, as a uh, uh, logarithmic plot. So you can see over a bigger range of, uh, of uh, wave vectors. And it, uh, so it works uh, surprisingly uh, well. So there's a circuit model for the uh, surface plasmon. What about the parallel plate transmission line plasmon? So an ordinary transmission line, it's very easy to solve for it. And you just get these waves propagating at the speed of light. But now we want to treat it in a more sophisticated way. And we want to take into account the kinetic inductance. And uh, the capacitance is a little bit more complicated because the field lines, they can jump to the same metal as in a surface plasmon, or they can jump to the opposite plate. So we have two different forms of capacitance. And uh, so this is the most complicated version where both things happen. It requires five circuit elements to describe. And some of the simpler cases uh, we know very well. Uh, uh, this case, and this is very interesting. This is uh, uh, when you don't have a kinetic inductance. Even at microwaves, you should get surface waves. And uh, this is the uh, exact solution. Again, th this is uh, two metals with a dielectric. You can solve it exactly, or you can use the circuit model. Surprisingly good agreement between the circuit model and uh, the exact model. Very, very uh, satisfying. OK, and this is the same thing uh, on a logarithmic uh, plot, so you can see it more clearly. Uh, now, when can we call things plasmons? You know, the, the word plasmon, I think, gets overused. Because sometimes it's just metal optics. Sometimes uh, it, uh, it doesn't really have kinetic inductance. So I've made a plot here of the three components of impedance. Uh, first is the resistance. Uh, then we have uh, the Faraday inductance. This is normal. But there's the new term, the kinetic inductance. And so uh, in this plot, you see the three different regimes. And uh, if you have a very thin wire, it's resistive. If it's a thick wire, uh, the inductance is the dominant term. And uh, on the other hand, the kinetic inductance uh, tends to dominate at high frequencies, especially near the surface plasmon frequencies, and at the very smallest scale, say be below 25 uh, nanometers. So I would say the term uh, plasmon is overused. If you're simply doing metal optics, and let's say you're in the infrared, and you're, you're uh, over here somewhere, uh, then don't call it plasmonics. It's just metal optics. On the other hand, if you're toward the blue, and a very, very small size scale, uh, then you're in this region, and uh, it is indeed plasmonics in that region. So let me distinguish uh, what it is. In, in this region of the three terms, the kinetic inductance is dominant, and that makes it plasmonic. So I have three quick view graphs. This is silver uh, for a wire. This is silver for a parallel plate. Uh, this is gold for a wire. And uh, this is a, a gold for parallel plates. So they're, they're all kind of similar. You need to be at uh, toward the blue and toward the nanoscale to call it uh, plasmonic. Now, how can we go to the nanoscale efficiently? Uh, it's, uh, it's troublesome. Uh, you could use a transmission line and, uh, and maybe uh, uh, come to a sharp point and, uh, and maybe that would focus the energy to a sharp point, but there's a problem that occurs. And uh, the problem is resistance. As you go to small size scales, the resistance goes as length over area. So on, this, on the nanoscale, the, the resistance gets very, very large, because uh, this ends up going as 1 over the characteristic dimension. So resistance goes up and up at the nanoscale. 
uh, everything gets very lossy. That's why we never wanted to use metals in optics. But things have changed a little bit. And let me point out the key feature, if we include the kinetic inductance, we have, and this is the standard formula for the impedance of a transmission line, uh, the kinetic inductance adds to the ordinary inductance and makes the impedance much, much larger. So in effect, a uh, tapered uh, plasmonic transmission line acts as a transformer. And so the way to think of it, you have a wire, it has normal impedance, but it, if it comes to a very sharp point, it has very high impedance uh, because of the extra inductance. And uh, this uh, has great benefits in uh, transporting the energy to a sharp tip efficiently. And the benefit is illustrated uh, from how we use transformers in electric power distribution. Uh, we also, we're fighting resistance. If we have all these transformers on the poles, uh, we can overcome the resistance by boosting to high voltage and low currents, and that's exactly what happens when we have a sharp metal tip. The voltage goes up, the current goes down, and uh, you end up with reasonably good efficiency in spite of the resistance. Now, how to do this, it's a little bit subtle. Uh, you have to have a double taper to get the transformer benefit. So this is a single taper, but this is a double taper, a 3D taper. Here, no transformer benefit, and here you do get a transformer benefit. And uh, so I have here an example of a uh, transmission line where some of these effects uh, were seen. And it uh, gives you uh, uh, some idea how it was made. So here's a parallel plate transmission line coming to a uh, sharp tip. And I'd like to show you what happens. You focus the energy to the uh, sharp tip. And I have a, a movie, which I hope it comes on. Uh, let's see. Uh, the, uh, so we are focusing here. This gives you an idea of what you're looking at. And uh, with some kind of luck, we will see uh, the uh, focusing. Uh, let's see. Well, the movie didn't come on. Uh, let's see. Well, here's what the movie would have shown. Uh, the movie would have shown uh, a sharp tip going to uh, uh, all the energy would end up at this uh, very, very sharp tip. And uh, the, uh, this type of focusing, I think, is uh, uh, relatively um, uh, standard. And uh, let me um, show you how it's being used. It's being used in the hard disk industry and uh, indeed, uh, w the hard disk industry now wants to use optics to change magnetic state by creating local heating and turning a uh, magnet uh, on and off uh, in a tiny nanoscopic uh, spot. And this is actually work we're doing with the Hard Disk Industry Association and some of the uh, companies there. Uh, one of the schemes is to um, have a grading coupler and then to focus down to a little antenna structure and, uh, well, there are so many types of antennas. And now, in, uh, in the case of metal optics, the industry was actually ahead of many of the academic people. They were already studying this before uh, plasmonics was very popular. And, but they had a different name for everything. Instead of calling it antennas, they call it a near-field transducer, uh, which is fine. And there are many kinds, so it's like a zoo. They all work somewhat similarly, but uh, the, uh, the, there's sort of a competition between the different antenna designs. Uh, now, uh, one of the things I would like to say is that in spite of all the different designs, uh, a circuit model is quite helpful here. And uh, just giving you an idea, this is the magnetic material, and you have the antenna structure and uh, driving currents in the magnetic material and locally uh, turning the magnets on and off. And you can uh, look at a different way. Uh, here's a tapered transmission line. And again, uh, you can uh, visualize the magnetic medium as being a resistive load and have uh, uh, both capacitance here and inductance leading up to it. So the circuit model is actually quite helpful. Uh, now I'd like to, which uh, comes as a little bit of a surprise, I like to do the derivation uh, uh, on my tablet. But uh, let me see if I can do it. The Purcell effect is a very famous effect in which Purcell described uh, uh, over uh, 60 years ago as uh, being due to cavities, that you could get enhanced spontaneous emission in a cavity. However, I'd like to show you that it's actually uh, not as fundamental as it sounds, because I'm going to give you an RLC derivation, a circuit derivation, 
of the Purcell effect. So here is my cavity. It is a parallel plate capacitor uh, with an uh, inductor between them, so it's an LC circuit. And I have a small movement of some uh, charge here. Maybe uh, uh, this is a little oscillation of some uh, uh, AC current in a molecule. And I'd like to know uh, what happens uh, to the uh, power uh, radiated by that molecule due to the presence of the LC circuit. Uh, so uh, I can, um, uh, first of all, I, I know the, the current and the charge uh, on the plates. If the charge is moving a short distance, I get a, a small amount of charge on the surface, and then I can just express the Q of the cavity uh, this way. This is all standard LC circuits, and uh, therefore I can derive the resistance. I can uh, write it in terms of the Q. I can flip this equation back and write the resistance in terms of the Q. Now I just use a simple expression. The power lost to the cavity is the voltage squared over the resistance, I know the resistance. I know the charge on the uh, plates, so I know the voltage on the plates. And uh, so there's a lot of cancellation. Uh, the uh, net result, it's kind of neat to go through this, but the net result of this is that uh, you end up with a power radiate to the cavity is the Q of the cavity divided by the volume. The volume is just this cubic volume here. So it's uh, rather uh, remarkable. This is essentially reproducing uh, the, uh, uh, the Purcell effect uh, in, uh, uh, in, these, uh, in this type of uh, simple uh, cavity. So circuits are everywhere. Now, uh, let me close out with one more application, uh, and that is optical antennas. And, you know, in uh, radio, in antennas are really very, very important. I can uh, pull out my cell phone, and, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing that you, you, you just have this little tiny thing. You can talk to maybe two, different, two billion people on the planet who have cell phones. It's, it's, it's kind of uh, remarkable. So the antenna is, is a remarkable property. We have not used antennas much in optics, though. And so uh, let me point out there are different styles of antennas. They, they all perform relatively uh, similarly. Uh, it's important to know some of the properties. It, it, unfortunately, it's hard to find a good book on antennas. But one of the things that you learn about antennas is that there's an equivalent circuit, and uh, the, uh, there's a, this concept of radiation resistance, which is related to the impedance of free space. And uh, so it's, it's good to have an antenna resistance or the radiation resistance uh, uh, close to the impedance of free space. So uh, let me uh, skip by the circuit model. I, I should mention I am, uh, I've become an antenna buff because I started this company, uh, Ethertronics, which actually uh, last year shipped 100 million antennas for cell phones. So there's a lot to learn uh, about antennas. But now, to my surprise, I find myself using antennas and optics. So what I'd like to say is that antennas can greatly speed up spontaneous emission. And you say, well, spontaneous emission, isn't that the old stuff? Uh, the, the, uh, you know, ever since the lasers, stimulated emission has been much more important than spontaneous emission. And I would like to say we have overlooked the importance of spontaneous emission. And so I'd like you to picture a molecule and say, well, what does it take to have spontaneous emission from that molecule? Uh, first, it has to store the energy. Well, there are a few materials, quantum dots, a few dye molecules. If, if there are certain material systems that do a good job storing the energy. But then it has to perform a second function. It has to radiate the energy. Now, in an excited molecule, there are actually little AC currents at the optical frequency inside the molecule. And in effect, the molecule is acting as its own antenna which is fine, and it does produce spontaneous emission. However, there's a flaw, a little problem. If you ask, what is the best antenna? The best antenna should be half a wavelength long. And uh, let's say you're at optical frequencies, half a wavelength would be 500 nanometers. Okay, so, well, wait a minute. The molecule is 1,000 times smaller than the optimum antenna. So the molecule, obviously, is a very inefficient antenna because it's too small. So it should be half a wavelength. But actually, it's worse than what I'm describing. If you go specifically through antenna theory, you find the penalty is not a factor of 1,000. It's 1,000 cubed. So the spontaneous emission is penalized in speed by a factor of uh, close to uh, 10 to the 9, 
which is a billion, which is a huge factor. And that is why spontaneous emission is weak and stimulated emission is strong. However, if we provide an antenna to a molecule, uh, then uh, we can make up for the fact that the molecule is too small to be a good antenna, and we can speed up the spontaneous emission by this enormous factor. And if you go in detail, I have a couple of slides now, they're a little mathematical, I'll go in detail, but the conclusion is that spontaneous emission can become faster than stimulated emission if the spontaneous emitter has the benefit of an antenna. Okay, so that, that's the uh, program that I, I, I'm going to use here in my last uh, a few minutes. Uh, so uh, let me uh, try to show that. Well, this is an example, and uh, this is kind of a neat derivation. It's a, sort of a back-of-the-envelope derivation uh, of the amount of power, the rate of radiation uh, from a molecule, and I've normalized it to the optical frequency itself. Uh, so it is uh, quite surprising. Uh, we have here, um, this is a standard formula for antennas. Uh, you put in the radiation resistance. The current in a molecule, well, you know, the charge oscillates back and forth within the molecule at the optical frequency, so it's very easy to get the current. And you go through this, you normalize it, you multiply and divide by epsilon naught, etc. go through, and then you come to a very surprising conclusion, that the uh, inherent speed limit... Uh, of uh, spontaneous emission, uh, if you provide the antenna, is uh, normalized to the optical frequency, is related to the fine structure constant. This is the famous number, 1 over 137, uh, which uh, actually, it has a physical meaning. In, um, in certain system of units, it represents uh, the uh, electric charge squared. So uh, it, if you H bar equal 1, C equal to 1, it, it's just electric charge uh, squared. So this is a very high speed. This is like 1% of the optical frequency. This is an incredible speed of spontaneous emission. Uh, but you can go farther. I should mention, here's the speed. It's very fast. Uh, now, uh, I want to go a little bit farther. Um, uh, well, first I'll tell you wh why this is hard to do. Uh, you have to, it, it's, it's easy enough to make a 500 nanometer antenna, but you have to make the vertex of the antenna uh, very, very close to the molecule. So uh, unless you have made this little vertex almost molecular sized, uh, there's a speed penalty. And whatever speed up you have, you have to penalize it by that factor. And so that's the experimental challenge. Now, what if you go faster? To go faster, everyone knows you, if you have a cavity, you go faster. Uh, an LC circuit is a cavity, so I now I add an inductor. Some people call this the Purcell effect, but I already showed you the Purcell effect is a circuit effect. And so I have now uh, an LC resonator. Now, you might think, uh, oh, this is some kind of strange cavity. Uh, the truth is every one of your cell phones has a matching network with inductors, and, uh, it, it, and it's, called a, it's just a matching network, and it helps the, the radiation get out better. And so this is the same. We're just extending the same ideas to optics. And uh, so we go now again through a, a calculation, and uh, I, the, the steps are done a little bit differently, but the net result is, again, we are controlled by the fine structure constant, but now it looks like it's the square root, which is even a bigger number, and uh, which is like uh, 0.1. So now we're uh, maybe uh, almost close to the optical frequency itself. So this is, this is what's possible. Uh, so... Uh, in terms of the uh, speed up in spontaneous emission. So let me say, I've, I've uh, tried to describe a way to look at metal optics just in terms of uh, circuits, uh, uh, and uh, I think it's very satisfying. In, it unifies the microwave regime with the optical regime. I've derived the bulk plasmons, I showed you the circuit. The surface plasmons, I showed you the circuit for that, and also for the parallel plate plasmons. I've shown how a tapered sharp point can act as a, uh, a transformer, which is, uh, the, all these things are very helpful. I think this is going to be the biggest application in metal optics is thermally assisted uh, magnetic recording. Uh, I've shown that the Purcell effect for spontaneous emission is actually a circuit effect, and that indeed uh, spontaneous emission can be made uh, very, very fast. And I think that's the next frontier, is to uh, apply uh, uh, apply antennas to uh, optical effects 
so that uh, we can be at the nanoscale. And when we're at the nanoscale, it'll, it'll be very much uh, described by uh, circuits. Now, if you're curious about the circuit approach, we do have something on the archive. There is this uh, paper on the archive that you can look up uh, showing how to derive all the uh, circuit properties associated with metal optics. Okay, thank you very much.